So I'm, I'm curious, Merrick, in, in uh, patients who are referred to you, do you stage them with uh, CT scans and PET scans before you do surgery, or do you refer them to a medical oncologist, or do you do all this yourself? So in, in this patient population, the most likely scenario is that they have no symptoms referable to metastatic disease. And actually, routine staging for patients with clinically localized disease, pretty much regardless of the primary tumor factors, except for maybe the patients with thick melanomas that is greater than four millimeters and an ulcerated primary, would have uh, some risk of having synchronous um, metastatic disease that you can uh, demonstrate on, on, on scanning. But generally speaking, in the asymptomatic patient, uh, routine staging, whether it be PET scans or CT scans, are more likely to identify a false positive than a true positive. And because of that, we usually offer surgery without doing any staging whatsoever. That would change probably in the patients who have a positive sentinel node, because those patients are going to be candidates for adjuvant therapy, and every medical oncologist would probably do a baseline staging workup before starting adjuvant therapy. So you could argue whether to do the staging before they have the completion dissection after a positive node or, or wait till after they finish their surgical therapy to do the staging. Because again, even in the patients with a positive sentinel node, the, uh, the uh, incidence of finding disease and scanning, again, would be a much higher rate of false positivity than true positivity, except for maybe the thick melanoma patients that are ulcerated that have a positive sentinel node those patients may have some risk of demonstrable um, uh, distant metastatic disease. And, and do you, would you do a PET scan or a CT scan in think that it's, setting? I think it's kind of dealer's choice. Um, I, I, think what, I think either one is fine. Again, PET scan probably is very sensitive and more likely to have false positives that you have to kind of pursue. Uh, but I think uh, e either one is fine. Uh, and the other question is, should we always do kind of a baseline brain scan, whether it be, you know, a, 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 an MRI, because a PET scan would not be the best test to uh, evaluate very small disease within the brain. But I think you guys, the medical oncologists, would all probably want to have a baseline MRI of the brain before starting adjuvant therapy. Is that correct? Well, definitely. In uh, a progressed uh, high stage 3 melanoma, we definitely look with an MRI. I think it should be risk adjusted, as, as you both pointed out, in terms of how you do your sentinel node biopsy, it should not just be the thickness, it should not just be a biologic trait of the disease. I would think we would rather have it be the likelihood that someone will actually have a true positive. So yeah, if someone has stage 3B, 3C disease or resected stage 4, I would stage them by doing an MRI of the brain and a PET-CT scan, and it's probably one of the few times I would routinely do a PET-CT because I think it would certainly change the management. No question. Yeah, but I, I also think we have to remember that the median volume of disease that we find in patients who have a positive sentinel node is pretty small. It's like one millimeter of disease within the, within the sentinel node. So that's pretty early nodal disease. So I think we have to remember that, and that's kind of the, 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 um, uh, the beauty of doing the sentinel node biopsy is really identifying patients with very early nodal, you know, nodal disease because we know intervention at that level uh, whether it being that sentinel node biopsy being therapeutic in itself or the completion dissection, adding something, that, that, that those patients really do well compared to patients who have palpable nodal disease. And the data would show, based on prospective randomized trials, that the patients who have positive sentinel nodes, the node positive patients actually benefit compared to patients who are just observed after a wide excision and develop clinically palpable disease. About, about a 20% survival difference in the, node, in, in the two node positive groups, microscopic versus macroscopic. Yeah. That, that was a retrospective analysis of that. that no. Well, well uh, it was a planned prospective analysis of a, of a subset of patients. Because understand, going into these prospective randomized trials of sentinel node biopsy, only the patients with positive nodes can benefit from the therapy that's being tested. No one benefits by removing the nodes that are negative from a therapeutic perspective. The information about the nodes may be important, but thinking about it, 80% of the patients in those trials cannot benefit from the therapy that's being tested. So I think it's not unfair to look at the node positive groups because they were actually extremely similar in their initial uh, primary tumor factors going, going into the trial. So they really are the same patients because the incidence of nodal failure in that group is somewhere around 20, 22 percent, and it's the exact incidence of the, n the number of patients who had a positive sentinel node. Although the fact that 80 percent of the patients will have a negative sentinel node will dilute that 20 percent benefit by a factor of five. Correct, correct. correct. So correct. overall, correct. It, I, I, in my heart of hearts, I think that 
the, for the whole group, you will have a 3, 4, 5 percent benefit in survival. Correct. Which means to pick it up, you need a big study. It's expensive. Correct. And then the question is, given the cost of doing the sentinel node biopsy, is it justified by the modest benefit? My personal feeling is probably yes, meaning I can sell it to patients. But I gather there are those who think it's probably not worth it because there isn't enough survival. So, but part, part of the problem is that you don't have, we don't have the right biomarker yet to identify the patients who have a positive node. I mean, example, other, you know, other types of targeted therapies. We, we select the right patient population to do the study so you don't have to have huge study with a lot of power, right? And right now, we don't have the best market to identify who has a positive sentinel node, although there's some, and maybe we'll get into this, there'll be some interesting genetic profiling that may be useful in the future. But I think, I think there's two points that uh, maybe we're not addressing. One is I think there's, there's a benefit, not outcome benefit, but benefit for the patient knowing really what their risk is. So the Sentinel node gives those patients a real idea of what their ultimate risk is of surviving and living a long life. And I think a negative Sentinel node can be an incredibly reassuring finding. It's not 100 percent, but certainly it makes a big difference. I think the other thing is uh, the MSLT1 trial that you referred to. I think we all believe uh, uh, that group did benefit. On the other hand, it, there is this assumption that it is the same group of patients. And really the only way to, to really define that, which is what's being done now or finishing, is a trial that takes those patients and then randomizes them to completion node or not to, to just observation. So you're specifically speaking about MSLT2 in which you right. take cell node positive patients and randomize them to surgery versus observation. So, so 